Awesome. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Sarah McAnulty. I am with Skype a Scientist. And today, for the last time in the year 2023, we are going to be running a Q&A all about science. Today, we are talking about physics with uh, Jamie. Hello, Jamie. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm happy to be here. Awesome. Um, so uh, housekeeping, as you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. You can find that at the bottom of your screen. Looks like we already have uh, questions coming in, which is excellent. Um, that sounds good, Lars. Um, and uh, from here, I think let's just kick it off. Uh, Jamie, could you tell us who you are, what you do, and why you like it? Yeah. Hi, I'm Jamie. I'm a first year graduate student. I attend Columbia University. Um, I am a plasma physicist. I study plasmas. Um, I went to the University of Washington for college, and now I'm here uh, in Columbia for my PhD. And I study plasmas and how they can be used and applied to make energy. Awesome. So the first question we have to ask, uh, so we, we talk about states of matter um, and the ones that I think are sort of intuitive for people are solid, like my table, liquid, like the water I'm drinking, gas, like we're breathing. And then there's plasma. Um, I know it has something to do with lightning, but I really don't know anything other than that. So what, how do we uh, like understand what plasma is, um, where we might encounter it and like what makes it special? Yeah, so if you think about the states of matter, you got ice, and that's really, really cold, right? And when you heat up your ice, maybe you get water, right? And if you heat up your water, you get steam, like a gas. What happens if we heat up the gas? What happens then, right? So a plasma is just when we heat a gas up, it gets so, so hot that the atoms inside of the gas now split apart. Now you have your electrons and your, you know, your nucleus, your ions. So a positive charge and a negative charge. So if you think about it, a gas, a plasma, sorry, is a really, really hot gas that now separated into these two charges. So for example, in real life, you can see it in lightning. So, you know, you heat up the atmosphere really, really hot through that lightning, it now separates into those two little bits. Uh, in the same way, our sun is really, really hot, right? So it's not just a gas, it's a really hot gas, so it separates as well. And I mean, if you look at the aurora borealis up in the north, that's actually an example of plasmas. It's our atmosphere kind of following our poles, our magnetic lines that follow the earth. So it's really, really cool. Well, the benefit of us talking right now um, about something that I have literally no clue about is that I think I'm about uh, right at third grader level of understanding plasma. So I'm gonna be asking a couple of clarifying questions. So at least I understand what's what's going on to the hopes that the audience does too. So all of stuff is made of atoms and the atoms have a core with protons and neutrons, right? Yeah. And then the surrounding, you've got electrons kind of just like floating around in a cloud zipping all over the place. Yeah. Okay. And so every, like, like what, are, what are the, what are the things that are positively and negatively charged that normally would be like mishmashed all together that in a plasma situation separate? Yeah. So kind of like how our earth and our moon are kind of locked together in the moon, you know, kind of orbits around our earth. Well, similarly, in the atom, the electron likes to orbit the uh, nucleus, so what the core is kind of that, and they're and they're attached together by a force together. But imagine if it's really, really hot. So that's kind of like I charged up that electron. It's now zipping really, really fast. Imagine the moon zipping around the Earth at a really, really high speed. Well, at some point, it's just going to shoot off. It's going to fly away. So in the same way, our electrons are flying off our little cores because they're so hot and just so charged up. Well, um, if I, I don't know if I answered your question. No, this is, this is good. If I was, if like, if my head was the, the nucleus of an atom and typically maybe, I don't actually know the scale of these things. If my electrons are normally like in this area, how far away, like in my house or in my neighborhood, would those electrons go away from me in a plasma state? Well, they can't go that far because once you go pretty far, they no because longer. you know how like opposites attract, right? It, right? The electron all of a sudden sees the nuclear that core again. It sees it's positive, even though it's flying away, it still sees it. So it's like, I want to go back. Go back. Oh, but I'm really hot, so I'm gonna go far away again. Mm. It's kind of like stuck in this back and forth. So that's why the plasma kind of stays in a big blob because it's just 
so hot, it's running around, but it still sees the positive course, so it's still attracted to it. So gotcha. imagine like the moon just flying really back and comes back and then comes forward, kind of like that. Yeah, and we can be right. massive, like, you know, our sun's really big. Think of that as a really big plasma. And if you go far beyond in our galaxy and our universe in the interstellar media, so like if you guys see photos of the universe, you see these all really pretty like pictures, those are all plasmas, those lights and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and they can be light years apart, so they're really big. Awesome. Okay, so let's start getting into our questions. Uh, Jafita asks, uh, what exactly is plasma physics? Like on a day-to-day -day basis, what kinds of questions are you answering? Um, and what is like, what does a plasma lab look like? Yeah, so I specifically study plasmas to use them, like apply them towards making energy. So what that looks like kind of in a lab is that we have this big metal donut that sits in the basement of a lab. And inside that metal donut is where we put our plasma. And we use a lot of little instruments to kind of measure the different things about the plasma. Like how does the plasma interact with the walls or the metal inside of the donut? Or, you know, what happens if I charge it up so much? What happens? What are the, how does it behave? And there's so many different ways we can look at, but there's also many other different labs that, you know, they shoot a laser into the plasma and they're like, what happens if I shoot a laser into the plasma? What, what happens? And so kind of there's so many variations. Some people like to study it just by itself and other people like to study it to figure out how are we going to apply it and, and make something out of it. Cool. Um, our uh, Noah wants to know, uh, do you have a plasma ray? And also for the rest of us, what is a plasma ray? <laughs> uh, um, I think a lot of people, when they think of plasma rays, they think of like, kind of like in Star Wars, like the lightsabers, or you got your like pew pew. Um, you know, most of those are lasers, but I would imagine a plasma ray could could be done. Uh, we don't have a plasma ray in my lab, but I think, you know, I don't know if anyone heard of the recent news of the National uh, Fusion Ignition Facility at Lawrence Livermore. It happened last year. Basically, they took a big laser and they shot it into a plasma. And, and you could kind of think of that as a plasma laser ray, kind of. Um, it was big news last year, but nice. people forget. It's funny what um, feels like big news to, to one group of people. Everybody, oh, for sure. Are like, huh? um, <laughs> big news for the like uh, molecular biologists this week is that somebody took electric eels and tried to uh, electroporate, which electroporation is when you have little bits of DNA floating around in a liquid and you want to get them into an animal cell or a bacterial cell for, for science purposes. And what we typically do is shock it and then it gets in there because the shock moves the DNA in there. And scientists in Japan used electric eels to make that shock happen. And all of the molecular biologists are just absolutely freaking out about That's it. Really it works. Cool. Like eels could work for molecular biology. Whew, pretty cool. Um, anyway, uh, Josh wants to know what are one of the main things you could do with plasma physics and why is it relevant for, uh, for everyday life? Yeah. Um, so the main use of plasmas currently today is actually how we make chips and little transistors. So inside our phones, our TVs, our electronics, there's like a little green circuit board. And on that little green slab is a lot of tiny little components. And so how do you make those things? Well, we actually use something called plasma etching. Uh, we use a laser and we shoot it down into the our, maybe our piece of metal and we, we you know, kind of scratch out a little chip component, um, but that actually turns into a plasma um, because the laser is heating up the metal and the air around the metal will also get heated up and that turns into a plasma. So the majority of plasma physics is actually used in manufacturing these little electric components. But uh, my field, we wanna use plasma to make energy. So think of our sun, right? Our sun is actually a big ball of plasma and it gives us energy. So how does that happen, right? Well, if we compress the plasma, we squish it so tight, it actually merges atoms together. And when they merge together, it creates a big burst of energy. And so that's how our sun actually, and that's, that process is called fusion. So that's how our sun actually makes energy. And we wanna do something similar on earth. Cool. Is that currently happening or is that a thing we can't do yet? We currently can't do it, but we're working on, on making it a thing. Like we can oh. do fusion, but how do we do it to make it more energy, right? Totally. Cool. Um, uh, let's see. 
Oh, okay, this is a great question. Um, we've got a question from Bridge Students in Orange, Virginia. If you put grapes in the microwave, does it really create plasma? Yes. That's a great Ow. way to make a plasma. <laughs> I have not personally done this, but at our, you know, scientist conference, there's a little student section and they all talked about heating a grape in the microwave. And that's, so yeah, I don't think you should try this at home because that sounds dangerous. But yeah, when you put a grape in the microwave and you heat it up, it turns into a plasma. Would you I, know I don't know about grapes specifically? I would imagine that because grapes are really watery and right. in a little ball that when you heat it up with the microwave, how a microwave works is it heats up the water and like literally the water jiggles in place. So it just heats it up so much that it, I don't know, I want to say explode, but it probably turns into a ball of light. I think I saw yeah, a I think they turn. I think they like start sparking. I, yeah, I so it must yeah. get so hot that it turns into a plasma. Uh, that's pretty cool. All right. Uh, the next question from Elijah, um, why did you become a scientist of plasma physics? What got you interested in the first place? Yeah, well, in high school, I think, and as a kid, I read the Lorax and I, I was really stoked about the environment, I think. And, you know, I was thinking and I was like, oh, these coal plants, they're no good. They, they release black stuff into the atmosphere and, and we don't like that. So I was thinking like, we need a better way to make energy. And so I learned about this thing called fusion energy. And, you know, fusion has the potential to be clean. It's abundant. You know, you're not going to be like, oh, we need a bunch of oil. It's just kind of, you know, we have the resources to make it happen. So that's how I kind of got into plasma physics coming from that angle of, oh, I want to make some develop clean energy and so it sort of led to that path of oh well I gotta learn plasma physics because fusion is based off plasma physics. Sounds great looking for clean energy getting into plasma physics I love that so okay fusion we don't know how to do it it's putting two things together gotta get plasma involved and then fission is that nuclear energy effectively? Yeah they're both two different forms of nuclear energy um, the problem with fission is, as I think we all know, it has a lot of like waste and it's radioactive. I don't know. And that isn't really healthy for us. So it'll be right. hard to get rid of all this uh, waste that it leaves behind. Fusion does not have as much waste, um, if any. Right. So fission, we're typically using uranium. Um, yeah. In a fusion situation, like what are the ingredients that would go into it? Yeah, something interesting is that we only need hydrogen. Um, and something interesting is that our seawater actually has a lot of this really good hydrogen inside of it that we can use. So it would typically actually use seawater and we would break that seawater down into its hydrogen and oxygen components and we would take that hydrogen and then heat it up and make a plasma. Why, why seawater instead of fresh water? I think it's because seawater might have some ions already floating inside of it. Um, if people didn't know, seawater has NaCl, and that's just salt. salt, salty, that makes sense. So these Na and these Cl kind of components, and those are just elements, they kind of just float around um, and they are charged, I believe. So seawater is actually very slightly electrically charged, right. like if you drop, toaster in it or something you get shocked a little bit but it's very small it would it would not don't worry about dropping your phone or anything yeah yeah I I think there's also a bunch of other stuff dissolved in seawater over the zillions of years of uh animals living in it and things breaking down more so I think than fresh water um I'll, we had to add more than just table salt to make our squid happy, for example. <laughs> it was a whole proprietary combination oh, of stuff uh, that we had to add to the water to make them happy. Um, awesome. So uh, Nathan wants to know, have you ever made something explode? I don't think that's a, a an official question, I think, but <laughs> things do explode and they are dangerous. So we do have to take a lot of safety trainings. Um, I'd say probably not explode, that much, but sometimes things do fly around a little bit Um, because we use very powerful magnets. I don't know if anyone knows what an MRI machine is, but in the hospital, there it's a very powerful magnet machine. And if there's anything like metal nearby while it's running, it'll fly and stick to that magnet. 
So our machines are also similar. So if you're not careful, something can fly around metal and hit the machine. Also, the inside of our machine is has really hot plasma. I was talking about that metal donut that has our plasma inside of it. Um, sometimes the plasma doesn't like to be contained. It, it's kind of, you know, it wants to run around and get out there so it can melt the walls of our um, metal donut on the inside, which isn't good. But not explosion, explosion, I'd say. Right. So in your metal donut, is that seawater in there? Uh, it's gas, gas usually, and we gas. heat up that gas to make a plasma. Cool, cool, cool. Um, Zoe would like to know what happens when plasma cools down? Yeah, so just like in the same way, like when you cool a liquid, it turns into ice. When you cool a plasma down, it, it turns back into a gas. So, um, okay, um, what I hope is not a silly question. So, no, don't worry, no silly questions. Right. When I look at a, a, a solid object, it looks generally not super see through on the whole. Like, this is not true of everything, but whatever. And then it, when I, uh, look at like a liquid it may be a little bit more see-through and then when I look at a gas because everything's like spread out it looks more see-through than that plasma what does it look like yeah a lot of the times it actually looks invisible but there are some times like when I mentioned that the plasma doesn't like to be contained and it can melt the wall when it does that when it interacts with something it's going to release a burst of radiation. Um, and so light is actually just radiation, right? So you're going to see a burst of light happening. And, and also in the same way our sun, if you think about it, it's releasing a lot of light and that's coming from the fusion process. Um, so as it's doing things, interacting with things, fusing with itself, it's going to release a lot of light and it can release a lot of different colors of light too. So that's why, you know, if you look at the photos of our galaxy and stuff, they look so colorful. There's like pink, there's purple. Those are all different kinds of plasmas releasing radiation, radiation, just interacting with itself. But if it's not doing anything, it's just sitting there happy. It's usually invisible. Pretty cool. How in, so I always think of space as being very cold. Um, how are things maintaining their heat and plasma form in space? Yeah, it's it's still also very cold, um, mostly because it's so big like and spread out that it doesn't have that heat, uh -huh. but it's still decently hot enough that plasma occurs and it wouldn't freeze up. So it depends where you are in space for sure. Sure. Um, Alexa would like to know what could happen if someone touched plasma? Oh, uh, let's see. I don't think anything would happen, but um, generally plasma is actually very diffuse. And what I mean by that is like when you hit something solid, you can feel it, right? When I put my hand through steam or gas, nothing generally happens, right? Because it's so spread out, it doesn't really interact with your hand that much. Similarly, in a plasma, it's also very spread out. So when you, you stick your hand in it, nothing really will happen. Although if you were interacting with our metal machines and stuff like that, those are very electrically charged. So if you stuck your hand in it, you probably would electrocute yourself. Or if that's, you generally, it's not, you're not gonna stick your hand in it. That would be very strange. But um, also our sun is very like, if you stuck your hand through this, the sun, if you could, and it's you actually wouldn't feel anything solid unless you get to the very very center it's just kind of like sticking your hand through gas but um the downside is the sun is very hot so you might burn yourself burn. really it does depend on. there's like a whole range of plasmas that you can have yeah. cool sounds good um all right ashanvi wants to know uh how is plasma related to blood oh that's a really really good question so the first guy the scientist guy that discovered discovered plasmas, he first called it an ionized gas. And what an ionized, ionized means electrically charged. It's just electric gas, kind of, he called it that. And then he saw plasmas in blood and he thought, whoa, that's a really good way of describing these electric gases. Because in our blood, in our blood plasma, it has a lot of different things floating around in it. And so that guy, I don't remember his name. It might be Langmuir. He said, this is just like our electric gas. It has a lot of different things floating around on it. So I'm going to call it plasmas. And so that's how the name kind of 
it's related as in they he took inspiration from it so so blood plasma came second it came first it came first blood plasma and, came first, and then physics we plasma. named it after seeing similar things we we're like this cool. is just like this ah, pretty cool um wonderful so okay harlow wants to know so you've got your plasma um how do you make energy from that plasma that's a really good question so when the plasma so you, first you get it really really hot and then we want to squish it together and so we squish our plasma together so obviously they're very these electrons i said earlier they don't want they're like flying around they have so much energy right and then we squish them together so it goes closer and closer to the atom and actually what we really want is these cores these nucleuses to fuse not our electrons but they're positive and positive and they, and they generally don't like each other. They like to repel each other, but because we're pressing them and we're compressing them so much inside this plasma, it finally together, it fuses. And what that really means is it overcomes this electrostatic repulsion, meaning it that force that makes them want to not be together. We overcome it and we access something called the nuclear force. So there's different kinds of forces like gravity, you got electrics, you got nuclear force. So the nuclear force will fuse them together. And when it, that happens, it will release energy. Cool, sounds good. Um, Zoe would like to know, what happens when you heat up a gas? Ah, that's a great question. So when you heat up a gas, basically you're, you're giving more energy to the gas. So basically you're, so imagine that electron rotating around that nucleus, you're giving that electron more energy, meaning it's going faster and faster and faster. If, imagine if I attached a bunch of rockets to our moon and just push the moon around so much so that it's going so fast, it flies off in the same way our electron is heated up and powered so much, it will fly off that nucleus and it will now create a plasma. Sounds good. Uh, Elijah wants to know, do you study the sun uh, to make plasma fusion? Can we like learn how it works over yeah. there? Yeah, we, I, I think the first idea of doing this also came from studying the sun. And I think a lot of ways how the sun behaves and, and different phenomenons we see on the sun can also describe like the things we see on our plasmas on earth and how they behave when we're trying to contain them, right? So, you know, our sun has something called like solar flares and stuff. And so those are plasmas following um, magnetic field lines. So imagine a bunch of light, like a little ball around the sun and it's invisible. Those are magnetic magnets basically. So they like to follow these magnetic lines. And so in the same way, our plasmas on earth also like to follow those magnetic lines and we kind of study the two and see the differences and how they can really work. Cool. So if a if a given um, matter goes from being a gas to a plasma, is the plasma version of that like more magnetic? Yeah, because some, it is electrically charged. Uh -huh. So electricity and magnetism are very closely related. They're actually the same force, but you'll learn that maybe if you choose to study physics, it's like a great re revelation. You're like, oh my God, they're the same. But um, yeah, so they're very related. So something electrically charged will also be magnetic. Cool. Sounds good. Oh, my cat. Oh, cat, oh, so man. cute. This is my Otis. She's named after bats. We're just gonna chuck her over here. Okay, oh. uh, she she's fine. She's very small. Uh, all right. Is the nuclear force related to strong and weak forces? Yeah, so that was what I was, um, so they're called the strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force. I was a little vague because I don't know if everyone knows, but sure, we um, all know. Yeah. I think for fusion interactions, it would be the strong nuclear force specifically doing the fusion. I don't know if it's the weak, I don't think it's the weak nuclear force. Cool. Uh, Erickson wants to know, what would happen if you froze plasma? Ooh, that's interesting. If you freeze a plasma, I'd imagine it's like freezing a gas because a long time ago, a bunch of scientists were doing a race to see who can get the coldest thing. And they were like, oh, I froze helium. Oh, I froze hydrogen. Um, and it became a solid basically. Um, so I'd imagine it would also become a solid. Just get really, 
really is there so sometimes we can go like um when we have um dry ice for example which is like the solid form of co2 you get sublimation where it goes directly from a solid to a gas without kind of skipping over the liquid phase at least from what we're perceiving is happening um is there ever something like in the reverse where you go from like straight from plasma to liquid and just like skip over Ooh, I don't think so I think it would most likely turn into a gas and I don't know I don't I'm, I don't think it would do that the reverse cool sounds good um all right Toa wants I'm to not know, sure uh is there a state of matter past plasma so we know solid liquid gas and then plasma you had heat uh is there a state of matter past those Ooh, that's a really good question. I think, I don't think so. I think at some point the scientists were like, okay, we can't keep naming things after it. So let's just call everything beyond this point plasmas. Also, um, something really, really interesting is that when you heat up your atoms, and I, I mentioned you heat them up. Oh, actually, that's a great way. So when you have a solid object, all these atoms are like stuck together, right? You heat them up and those bonds kind of break so these atoms are now wiggling around in a liquid and then if you heat it up even more your atom breaks apart into a positive charge and a negative charge so if you heat that up even more your nucleus what i mentioned is inside of the atom the center of the atom it has protons and then you know neutrons those will break apart now and then if you heat that even more the individual things that make up a proton and a neutron will also break apart. And those things are called quarks or little fundamental particles. We don't think there's anything below that. So um, you might've heard of quarks or something like that in like sci-fi movies or something like that. It's basically the mini particles that make up a proton or a neutron. In the lab, have we ever isolated quarks? Oh, I think for sure, if you go to like Switzerland and they oh, do CERN. CERN, they smash, basically they take the particles and they make them super, super fast and then they hit them. That force of hitting them will break apart everything. So you could probably get some, yeah, you could get the fundamental particles doing that. Cool. Um, I'm going to not ask the question I'm curious about because we'll go down a rabbit hole. Cindy at uh, Bridge, Orange, Virginia wants to know, are plasma TVs really plasma? Yeah, actually. Yeah. They're, they. Oh, wait, I'm not sure if the modern day. I think it is still. But the old TVs, they use something called cathode rays. I don't know. Probably past both of our times. But Basically, it was a little like glass tube behind it. And there was like a bunch of mini glass tubes and they would heat up the gas inside those little glass tubes to emit light and stuff. Um, so that was actually originally how the TV was made, was using plasmas. Well, I am unsure if plasma TVs, I would imagine they do the same thing because they share the same name. Although nowadays LED TVs LED is are more common and yeah. those are just little diodes, so... Cool. Uh, when those are just little lights so right that's right, what right. A diode is. yes um okie dokie um do, do, do. cameron wants to know is a plasma ball actually plasma i don't know what a plasma ball is do i don't you know, know what a plasma ball is either is that some kind of toy or something it might or be. Like... i don't know um all right zoe wants to know when is gas hot enough to be plasma Ooh, that's a really good question. Typically, there's something called a triple point diagram where it will show you the dip, the state of the matter at different temperatures. It also depends on what you want to make a plasma. Some things, you know, take much more heat to turn into a plasma versus other things. Um, so really, you want to look at that diagram and know generally, basically, we can tell when it has some electrical properties to it. Um, I'm not you could do some math to get it i believe but i'm not sure the exact process right now sounds good jackson wants to know how do you make plasma like okay we we've got a bunch of gas what are we doing to get it hot enough yeah that's a great question so in our metal donut <laughs> imagine a metal donut we put a bunch of gas inside of it we then shoot lasers into the that gas and it will heat up the gas 
And that's called current drive. So we're shooting current or lasers or shooting electricity into it. Um, and it's just charging it up to get it hot. There's many different ways. Actually, we have to do multiple ways. We have to use like radio frequency heating, I believe. We have to use electron cyclotron heating, I believe. So these are just all different techniques. Think about like lasers and, you know, almost similar to a microwave too. You can use a microwave actually, yeah. I was just thinking about the, the great question yeah. to get a plasma. So you just got to use different, basically different ways of shooting energy into a gas to get it hot enough. Cool. Sounds good. Elijah wants to know, how long have you been studying plasma physics? Yeah, I started, well, I, I discovered this in high school and then I didn't, you know, in high school, there wasn't really any opportunities to study it. So in college, I emailed a professor and I was like, and that professor was doing plasma physics. And I was like, hey, I'm interested in learning more and doing research with you. And that kind of started the ball rolling on um, getting involved. And I did that since say like sophomore year of college till now, which was about three, maybe four years, hopefully not too long. Yeah, you're answering these questions like a like a grad student who's been doing it for a lot longer. Oh no, I'm just, just a first grad year student. grad student. Well, you're doing, you're, you're, the Yay. you're doing a great job. Um, all right, Elijah wants to know, can the sun transfer plasma to earth? Oh, that's a really good question. <laughs> um, I think, so you heard of those things that I said were like solar flares. I don't, it's possible that they can reach earth. No, I don't think so. I think they have other effects though. When a big solar flare happens on on the sun, we can actually see it from earth and things can happen like solar wind, I believe. I'm not an expert on this. You'd have to ask an astronomy person, but you can feel some effects, I think. Also, there's like a situation where if there's like a really big solar flare on the sun, it has a possibility of affecting the electronics on earth yeah. and like our satellites too. So so it, it, it can, it, it, we do feel it sometimes. I can't remember what it is. I can't remember if it's like magnets something or gamma rays or something. Something, something yeah, yeah. over here, but I don't know what the mechanism is. Uh, yeah. All right. Taryn has got a question. Uh, can antimatter turn into a plasma? Ooh, that's a really good also, question. What exactly is antimatter? Do we know? Um, Antimatter is just the opposite of matter, which is strange to say, but like, you know, kind of like opposite charges in a way. You could think of antimatter as the opposite of matter. And when they meet, they like annihilate each other, meaning they cancel each other out. Annihilate seems like a very strong word. It does. I think, I have heard that it is possible to get an antimatter. Yes, there is, it is, sorry. Uh, there is antimatter plasmas. Um, there is electron positron uh, matter, uh, yeah, plasmas. Electron positron plasmas. And a positron is, I guess, the anti antimatter version of an electron, meaning it has a positive charge um, compared to the electron. Well, but I've only had it in my textbooks. Like they'd be like, give me a problem. And the problem would be about like positron electron plasmas. I have actually never seen one in real life. So I'm not right. sure. But they might be around us all the time everywhere, right? I'm not sure. Oh, antimatter? Yeah. I, maybe. You'd have to ask an astrophysicist, but yeah. I think so. I don't know. They're, they, yeah. they're, it's very small in number. Like, to actually make antimatter on Earth, you'd need a very powerful machine, like CERN or something. Um, yeah. Wild. Spooky to think about. Um, all right. Uh, okay. Jackson's got a question. What are some careers that you can have as a plasma scientist? Well, that's a great question. So plasma science, um, typically being a scientist, there's a lot of different options you can have. So one is, you know, going back into academia and working as a professor. The other is that you can actually work at a lot of national labs. So, you know, our United States has a lot of labs that they sponsor and, and have. So you can also work at these labs. There's also a lot of private companies that want to do fusion and plasma physics. Um, so you can also work there in a, in a little private company. 
And also in a lot of manufacturing, like I mentioned, plasma processing electronics, there's a demand for technicians and people that know that stuff too. So there's a lot of different options. Totally. How close do you feel like we are to getting fusion? Is that like a total pie in the sky or like we could get there in 10 years or like any minute? Who knows? That's a really good question. It gets asked a lot. Um, I think there is a really good company right now called CFS. Um, they're based, they came from MIT and they, and they claim that they're going to have fusion in about 2025, which is really That's soon. Practically now. That's so <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, and we also already accomplished fusion with ICF. Uh, I mentioned the Lawrence Livermore lab thing where they shot a, a tiny pellet with a laser. Um, they technically accomplished fusion last year. Um, but to actually see it on the grid is actually a whole different ballpark question. And that might take actually a while. Right, right. Cool. That's good to hear. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. December makes me so sleepy. Okay. Um, this is a cool question. Amina wants to know, is there plasma in the body anywhere, human or otherwise, any biotic life form, not just animals? We know we're breathing gas. We're swallowing liquids and solids in our bones and whatever. Well, like what, uh, is there any plasma? I don't think so. I mean, I think there's blood plasma, like our blood. Like blood plasma. But that's, but that's different, I think. Right, I don't think right, we right. have plasmas in our bodies. I'm right trying now. to think, where are things really hot? Or what? what I was thinking, really I was like, hot. maybe there's like a microscopic bacteria like somewhere living next to a volcano that might be able to do something. But anytime you say, like, no organism could possibly ever do. There's Anything. a bacteria that yeah, can do yeah. There's, There's always bacteria. a small There's creature so out there. Yes, yes, yes. Um, cool. How are we doing on time? Pretty good. Uh, we've got a couple more minutes here. Um, bridge students from Orange, Florida. Could a plasma occur at the center of the earth where it's so hot in the core? Yeah, I actually think that's a I pretty sure that is a plasma, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, it's hot molten metal in a kind of like a lava form. I would imagine it is plasma. I think so, at the very center. Sweet. Um, Jocelyn wants to know, how does plasma improve life around us? Yeah, so I think earlier I said, like, honestly, plasmas are responsible for, like, our screens, our phones, our TVs, our, you know, anything electronic that you can think of. Also, if you know, like, neon lights, like, you know, like, at a restaurant, it says open in the neon lights. Those are actually plasmas as well. Um so a lot of electronics use um, plasma physics, actually. Sounds good. Um, awesome. We answered that one. Um, okay. Uh, all right. Amir wants to know, how do you find plasma gas? Like if you're out, um, whether you're looking in space or you're looking on Earth, like how do you, if you can't see it, how do you know it's there? Yeah, typically we got to measure something through the radiation that it gives off, like the lights, like when we see it with the aurora borealis. Generally, when you see a gas emitting some kind of light, it generally is a plasma, uh, mostly because, you know, light is in itself radiation and it's interacting, you know, with electromagnetism. And that's generally when you got a plasma. Um, if it's invisible, that's a really good question. If we can't see it, Generally, I mean, you'd probably shoot some kind of electrical field into it. So um, what by that, I mean like a laser or some kind of diagnostic that can interact with it to get that radiation out of it. Um, I think so. Yeah, Sweet. I don't know. Sounds good. All right. And our last audience question, Adelaide wants to know, uh, is plasma considered a non-Newtonian fluid? Ooh, that's a really good question. Non-Newtonian fluid. Typically, when I hear non-Newtonian fluid, that's in reference to something. Oh, I know what that is. That's like cornstarch, right? And if you hit it, it hardens up. Oh, yeah. Um, plasma is a fluid. That is correct. A fluid is, that's a really complicated question. Gases can be fluids. Um, liquids are fluids. But a non-Newtonian fluid. Hmm. I would say it doesn't categorize as a non-Newtonian fluid for now, but I'm not sure about that question. That's a really good question. Awesome. 
Sounds good. All right. So at the end of every session, we ask everybody the same two questions. The first question is if you had everyone's attention in the whole world and you could tell them one thing about your area of expertise or within your area of expertise, what would that be? I think, you know, don't give up on fusion. I think there's a really good chance. And if we invest money into it, time into it, if we study it and have people working on it, it can it can be a thing that is really helpful in, in helping us you know, decarbonize, right? That idea of like wanting to do less fossil fuels, less carbon in our atmosphere. It, like we need ways of producing energy that don't produce carbon dioxide or harmful gases. And I think fusion is, is a good candidate, you know? Um, and it can work well with like solar or wind. You know, we need all of these things working together to ultimately, you know, be, have clean energy. It's a combination of things. It's not going to be just one thing that's going to work. Awesome. Super cool. All right. Uh, last question. Um, you still have everybody's attention in the world and you can tell them one thing about literally anything. It could be uh, important and serious or silly and whimsical. It could be whatever you want. What do you tell them? I have a coworker, a fellow grad student, and she always says peace, love, fusion. So I think that's a great thing to say. Great. Peace, love, fusion. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, and talking with us today. I just learned so much, so much about physics and fusion. I really appreciate it. I suspect our audience did too. Um, is there anything you'd like to share with us? Things that you, you want us to draw our attention to, where you can follow you on social media if you want, anything like that? Yeah. Check out, you know, the Columbia Plasma Physics Lab. We're doing a lot of cool stuff. And uh, maybe if I had any words of encouragement, I think, you know, I was, Physics is kind of daunting, I think, a lot. And you, when you think about physics and science, you think about math a lot and you're like, oh, that uses a lot of math. I think when I was most of our audience's age at third grade, I was actually really, really bad at math. Um, and it took a lot of effort. And I think a really lot of really good teachers that ultimately helped me overcome, you know, math and being able to actually do math. It's not something, you know, you don't have to be good at math to be able to do science. And I think you know, I would, I wish I could tell my third grade self, like you're struggling in math now, but don't you see, it's going to get better and you're going to be able to do it. So, and then you're going to do physics, which is so mathy. So, so math. you know, yeah, you got this, you know, don't give up. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, everybody, thank you for coming. This is our last session of the year. Um, if you have a topic that you hope will get covered in 2024, email me, uh, sarah at skypeascientist.com. I'm going to be making that uh, schedule in the next couple weeks slash months. So, um, you know, let me know what you want to hear about. We will book a scientist for it. Um, Jasmine, thank you so much for signing. Uh, appreciate you. And uh, we will see you all in the new year. Thank you again, Jamie. Thank you. See y'all. Bye.